Car racing to me was the goal of my life. I always say I, I didn't have a plan B. When a driver comes to the paddock, everybody wants his autograph. Sometimes we have to smuggle them in and smuggle them out because it's so popular. You never have to do that with a chief designer or a technical director. They are race drivers, they are half gods. You can't have standard machinery. You can't have standard men. The feeling you get when you're in the car, it is something that's extremely difficult to describe. I really like the speed. It's, it's, it's one of my favourite things. This is a foundation for young kids to get on the ladder into Formula One. Once you learn to race, then you've got to learn to win. We were challenged with creating an immersive experience of the future of Formula One. What we wanted to do was embrace the visceral, kind of human experience of being behind the steering wheel of the future. We were looking at the key innovations for the elements in that project, for the driver, for the track, and also the car. We're really interested in this line between the virtual and the real, and how you can augment the senses of a Formula One driver. A stereotypical Formula One driver is one very disciplined, for one thing. You have to be in the best possible physical shape. During a Formula One race, the human body can endure all sorts of forces. Neck stresses and core stresses are a big thing in the car, to say with all the G-forces. So we train the neck pretty hard. Driving an F1 car, it's on the limit of what the human body is capable of. It's like having a 30 stone man sitting on your chest throughout with the forces. Uh, you're looking at four to six Gs uh, into corners. The heart rate is so high in the car, it's almost like running a whole marathon for, for two hours. The physical aspect, once you're fit enough, is not the limiting factor. The limiting factor is your head. There's a lot of components on top of just driving the car as quick as you can and they have to be focused and concentrating throughout the whole race. They need to be 110% switched on. The car at the moment, they are incredibly fast and the technology makes everything more complicated to approach. You have lots of possibility of setups in the car to improve the performance, so you have to think about that. There's someone bearing down on him from behind, he's having to defend his position. On top of that, you have the strategies with the engineer, what's happening, what's going on around you. The engineer's talking in his ear, he's overtaking cars at 180 miles an hour, he then has to make changes on the switches. There's so many procedures that uh, makes our job even more complicated. Technology on the steering wheel, for example. There's 13 buttons, there's nine rotary switches. We have a clutch, paddle, on the wheel. We have shift up, shift down, on the wheel. There's a multi-function switch in the middle which has got 12, 13 sections to it. We have the radio button, we have the controlling of the diff on the wheel. He's got to manoeuvre those buttons and press those buttons as requested, wherever he is on the track that makes our job really <laughs> extreme at the moment. Sometimes people misjudge that compared to the, to the past is that the driver doesn't do the same thing. You know, it's not true. The driver shifts, uh, brakes, accelerate with no assistance at all. And I think they will try to keep that because that's what makes racing unique. If a driver becomes more irrelevant, the interest is lost. My dad, he was a racer himself. My granddad, he was a racing driver too. So I just wanted to carry on the tradition. Most of the drivers, they start from junior age. Watching the kart kids speed around the racetrack was quite eye-opening because not only are they amazing on the track, it's effortless, their use of technology. I'm carrying too much speed into the corner, but not having enough coming out. I don't have my lap times because I've got a mic on my steering wheel and it tells you the temperature, the revs and the times that you do. Youngsters today in general, um, technology just becomes something that's, that's pure instinct. They've grown up with it and they have a much more intrinsic link 
that is second nature. I do like to play racing games on my Xbox. I like playing on video games, especially car racing games. That's what I play mostly. You've got computer games, which in one way are a simulator of the driver experience. Then there's professional simulators that the drivers now use to increase their skill. We try and make the simulation as accurate as rubber on the road as we can. We kind of looked into a future where these two things cross over. And so virtual reality becomes a player. Maybe you can have filters that come up that display invisible forces. Telemetry will be at the core of that. We took Harold's design and put it through a physics simulation inspired by the computerised fluid dynamics systems that the F1 Lotus team are using. That gives us data that we can then artistically interpret. So you can see here, early tests with mapping graphics over sheet-like airflow. We're exploring different colours for different routes, different paths of airflow. Where the airstream splits at the front of the car, we can follow those streams down the length of the car. And when we change the car's shape, it shows us what happens to those streams. And if the skin of the car can shift, then you can use air brakes on a corner to chuck up a lot of turbulence. And if you're a chasing car, and you want to avoid that turbulence or you want to use it to slipstream, just being able to see airflow gives you a, uh, another tactical element to a race. car is an extension of myself. When you really focus and in that synchronization with the car, you will feel every vibration of the car and, uh, and ultimately you will feel what the car needs. There's many sensors on the car. You're the central one. We live in a connected world and I think that we can make a safe assumption that in the future, vehicles are going to be more connected with the driver. And one exciting thought was whether the brain waves can instantaneously communicate to the shape of the car. So with these renders here, we're just exploring the idea of uh, you know, the brain synapses sending a signal. The car responds instantaneously in the same way you can bend your muscle. It's, uh, it's an extension of the human body. The driver and the machine are, are kind of this symbiotic entity. It's sci-fi, but it's, it's actually starting to happen already. You know, you've got exoskeletons that plug straight into your brain so disabled people can walk. That stuff's crazy. You need just look at any child with a new piece of technology to realise that there's a real coming together of man and machine and when these kids grow up it's just going to be off the chart. They're the ones that are really going to experience an F1 that is like no other. Although technology can sort of augment the senses it still needs to be based in the appreciation of the skill of a driver because the human's never going to be replaced. I think AI could make Formula One very exciting. Whether it's more exciting or not, I don't know. You can have a race where you either have human drivers and AI cars compete against each other, or maybe even have races where you have all autonomous cars. You'll never take away the human element. People need somebody to support. They need to relate to that person. It wouldn't be fun if we didn't have heroes. I think the heroes would still be there. There'd, there, there'd be options of uh, software engineers, best coders or scripters. It could also become something similar to drone technology. The driver would be someone far away and remote. It's what the fans will accept. At the moment, the fans definitely wouldn't accept drones sat in a racing car. Speeds could increase. If something goes wrong and crashes happen, they would be more spectacular. At the same time, nobody gets hurt. If you have a circumstance where you can crash a car and then just pull out another one without any injuries or whatever, where's the fun? The fans want to get emotions and you get emotions through a driver making a mistake, through knowing that until this checkered flag, you don't know what's going to happen because I'm a human and I might make a mistake. You have to take 100% out of what the car can give to be able to be competitive. Ultimately, you know, they give you the best possible tool, but you got to use it. 99% you're just mediocre. 
but that fine line is 101% is disaster. With F1, that line can be the difference between life and death, and that's, that's kind of hardcore. I do like that. It's a dangerous sport. People love the danger. They like the fact that men are going into battle, if you like. We love it as well. There's adrenaline, but there's a little bit of, uh, of fear behind that you, you don't face, but you are aware of. It's sort of scary, but fun. As a dad, you want to watch it. Sometimes you just don't want to watch it. You just want to know the result. In the day, I'm really scared, and I'll stop Formula One because it's a passion. And the day you're afraid of your passion, and you don't try anymore. Quite honestly, if it didn't have that danger, it probably wouldn't be as fascinating as it is.